I, I met Luis Costa, which you will see a uh, picture of him and I, and he, this is where he lived. If you look, I you know I can't point, but you see that round house there. I don't know if you can point to it. That's it right there. That's where I stayed. And that's the Rio Araguaia right across the street. And he has a, a, a real rustic place. Now it's all built up. Luis died a few years ago at the age of 88. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy. The next couple of pictures will show you what he looks like. He was my best friend down here. I spent, I was on three excursions with him and uh, he didn't speak English, but he's, and I, I spoke Portuguese enough to get by and we used to laugh sometimes, but that was the hotel we stayed. It was a buck and a half to stay there overnight. And we even had uh, a continental breakfast, a piece of bread and coffee. And uh, it was uh, the three of us, uh, us two and Roberto Takazi who took the picture. Here's a picture of Luis and I, and he had a he had a beautiful pet shop in Brasilia. He had he had pet shop in Brasilia, and he had uh, one in in a uh, big shopping center in in Guayana that he had people run. His family took care of it, but he was just a great guy. I have more to say about him in a few minutes. What a beautiful place that was. We found some beautiful fish there, and uh, it was a Poptella orbicularis which is, uh, it's a poor man's silver dollar. A lot of the silvery fish that you catch in the wild all have that yellow tin. Now this we picked off Facebook. That's not my picture. We got that off of Facebook and that's an undescribed species as far as I know. That's be, it was found between Brazil and, uh, and Guyana. And the fins are, are very long as you can see. And I think it looks like another species of Poptella, which that's a typical black water pool. Beautiful fish that we found in there. This is the uh, Pleisolebius costi. Did I get that right? Uh, I don't know if it's Pleis, I forgot now. Anyway, this is named after my friend Luis. He does, he, he's the one that discovered this fish as well. So that's named after him. A lot of people might think Wilson Costa was named after him, but it's not. I would have liked to have seen it named Luis Costa, and then it would be isolated and be rewarded to him, but some people can get it wrong and they might think it's named after Wilson Costa, which it's not. Okay, there's two forms of Rakoviscus. The one on top is Rakoviscus gracilliceps. Uh, Carlos Cruz, who was a herpetologist in Rio, when I went to the museum there, I met him, got to be friends with him, and he had that fish in a tank. He had five specimens and he allowed me to photograph him. But on two occasions I had on two different occasions, I had them come out bright red like that. And I really missed the boat. I should have worked with them and produced a real red form. Up until a few years ago, before I had my problem with my, uh, with my heart, I had about a hundred of these left. And I spread them out. I just gave them away to different people. And right after that, shortly after that, they had a big uh, uh, mining disaster, Rio Dosi. It's a big mining disaster, it wiped everything out. And they just may be extinct in a while, we're not sure. Our friend uh, Carletto thinks that they might be completely gone. Hernucus pylorus. The fish really doesn't look like that. It's quite a picture. It's Hernucus uh, pylorus. It's a very beautiful fish, not easy to breed. They, they spawn like cichlids, they go into the cave and this pair is going into the cave and clean it up and get ready to spawn in there. And this male was really displaying to the female. I ran upstairs and I got my digital camera and I jumped up on the ladder. And the fins aren't bright red like that. The reason why it, it, it's so dramatic is when the strobe bounced off the red clay pot where they were cleaning to spawn, the red showed up as it, as it bounced off the clay pot. So it gave that beautiful impression. I said, well, what a great picture. But they really don't look like that, but they're quite nice though. I really oh, want to hear about the piranha story. You kept saying about it. We might as well hear it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we were going into the, um, we caught a bunch of fish in this one area in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Venezuela. It was really a wilderness. I must, I must have seen about 20 fox running around and your howler monkeys there. And we went into a small ditch. There's a big pipe there. And I went into this pipe. It was like, 20 fruit bats hanging in. Nobody else would have been screaming, but I said, no, hell, I'm, I'm getting these fish. They're flying all around my head. These are big bats. 
they were hanging in there because it was dark. And we caught dolly copters, we caught uh, uh, zonatas there. And we caught, uh, no, you know, was it zonatas? No, we caught the uh, honyai. Uh, not terribly, what, what's the name? They gave it another name. They changed the name. And I can't think of the name right offhand. And uh, we caught that. And then we went, there was a, a pond across the street in wide open spaces. I said, let's go there and see if we can collect some fish. Well, earlier we, we collected a bunch of tetras that were really beautiful. I wanted to take them back. And, no, he just throw them back in. We said, we'll get them back. But he made a mistake. Fish don't stay with it. They were always migrating. They're always foraging for food. So we went swimming because it was a real hot day. So we went back to that pond. And so we had the nets. And Leo was quite clever. He was a graduate of MIT. He was a very smart man. And, uh, and he lived in Valencia. And I knew him for a number of years. We were good friends. So he says, Rosario, get the other end of that net. He says, and we'll start staining here. And I said, OK. So I he put the net down. And I picked the net up on the other end. And we start saying, all of a sudden, he threw the net down. And he jumps and he runs out of the water. So what's the matter? He says, I just got bit in the leg by a piranha. I looked and here he's got a big hole in his ankle. I said, oh, man, my heart started beating. I said, what the hell am I going to do? I don't know where I am. I can't speak Spanish. And I don't know where to go. I don't know what direction I'm supposed to drive back to get back to, uh, to, to Valencia. And I said, boy, what am I going to do? I said, if he dies, what the hell do I do with him? I don't know what to do. I'm in a dilemma. And so I says, how about if I put a tourniquet on? No, he says, that's all right. It wasn't bleeding, but you could see the bone in his ankle. That's how much of a piece he took out of his leg. So we're looking all over for his keys. And I said, oh, where's the keys to the car? Oh, I don't know. I can't find them. And they were on top of the hood and we found them. So then we start and we start, and we start driving away. And we, we couldn't take the other fish. We took some of the fish we got. He had nets. He had uh, air in the back of his car. He had everything fixed up, nice pumps that he was taking off the off the off uh, his own battery. And we had aeration and all that. So we're driving. We get on the road. And uh, so I kept asking, Leo, are you OK? You want me to drive? No, I'm all right. I says, well, I don't know how they're going to fix that leg. I says, the skin is all away. It's all going to see your bone. He says, that's right. He says, I'm not a dancing girl. I still remember him saying that. And and then all of a sudden, we're driving only a few, only a few miles, and all of a sudden, the heat his, his uh, instrument shows the radiator start, radiator starting to boil over. Now we have no water. Here we're in 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 Venezuela. You think we have all the water in the world? There's no water around. It's the dry season coming on. You can see the Andes in a distance, and that's where the snow melt comes over to create the Amazon. So we're driving, and and then we had to pull over. The car is really overheating. And I said, wait a minute, uh, Leo. I says, we had an ice pack. I said, that ice pack must be melted by now. That ice pack's got water. Oh, good thinking. So we put that in there. And that's what saved us. This ice pack actually saved us from uh, cracking that radiator. And we filled it up, and then we were able to get to Valencia. And it took us a couple hours. We got there, and uh, uh, one of the doctors was his friend. And he says, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. He says, you're going to have to go to Caracas. And that's where he lived. He lived in Caracas. So his, his daughter lived in Valencia. So his wife came to the hospital. And I was apologetic. I said, gee, this is the last trip I went to. I'm here for six, six weeks in, in South America. And everything went smoothly. And the last day of my trip, I'm leaving for New York tomorrow. This had to happen. She says, don't blame yourself. It's not your fault. So she took the... She took my guilt away from me. So then we had to drive another few miles. And then finally we got to Caracas and they had a, a surgeon who was on a ball. And what he did was he kept pulling the skin and then sealed it. And then he had still about a quarter of inch hole in the center that was exposed. He said, you can't walk or do anything. You have to stay in bed for two weeks, which he did until that skin healed over. And that's what he did. So then a few months later, his daughter married a fellow from uh, New York, from Nyack, New York. And they had a wedding and I was invited to go. My wife and I were invited and we're sitting in a pool in a hotel. And I says, let me see that leg. He lay over, I saw it. It was all healed nice. I says, he says, yeah, we should have taken a picture of that because the doctor did say, did you take a picture of this? I says, no, I didn't. I didn't have, I was a masochistic. I didn't think it was right to say to him, 
hold on, let me get a picture of that leg when a guy had a hole in his leg from a piranha. But we should have taken a picture. It would have been the right thing to do. So we had it documented, you know. And so I said, to him, let's do this again. <laughs> he said, no, I don't think so. Anyway, that's just, that's the story of the piranha bite. It's the first that, time I saw, um, oh, the dwarf cichlid. Uh, Opalaris. Lupi? Was it Lelupi? You were breeding Lelupi at the time, but yeah. this was Biotopus. Um, Biotopus opercularis. Opercularis. Well, nobody so had I I'd it. never seen this fish before. Yeah, it was very rare fish at the time. Yeah, I got them in the Amazon. I caught them myself. Yeah, that was a unique story, too. Gorgeous. I caught 10 and I came back with three. And lucky for me, I had a pair. Yep. Yeah. And it was, you know, the great old slate bottom tanks under skylights with all these philodendron everywhere. So the fish on the top row, you know, just looked like fish you've never seen before because yeah. that combination was just perfect. Yeah, the sunlight. Lighting is so important to the reproductive modes of fish. The lighting really controlled it. And that's when a lot of fish spawn as soon as the sunrise. When it's comes up. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the philodendron. Uh, explain how you were using that in your fish room. Well, I just put cuttings going in a tank and they had big root systems and that fish would, it would, it would take the nitrates and nitrates out of, out of the water. That's why I used it. It helped, helped, helped to, uh, to clean the water. And that's not the word I wanted. It helped to filter it, really. Yeah. I, I remember it was like scattered all across the whole yeah. rows of tanks. As a matter of fact, Bob Allen, who's a big cichlid guy in, in Salt Lake, I went to his house and I spoke out there and I said, boy, I'm glad you got skylights. He put up a fish room. I think he got 12 skylights. I said, I'm glad you got skylights. That's smart. I said, because I really believe in natural light. He said, I'm sorry I did it. I said, why? He said, because I get too much algae. I said, you can, yeah. you can stop that. Just put philodendrons in. So the next time, Oh, we talked on the phone. So I said, I'll bring you some. So I brought some cuttings. I gave them to him. He put them in the tanks. And he told me about a year later, he says, it worked. He says, I have no green water anymore. He put them in his tanks. They're growing all over the place. And he gave them the proper shading and, and helped to uh, filter the water out. And he did very well. Do you have a favorite fish that you would want to, that you can identify that you'd want to have in that tank? Oh, boy, that's a hard choice for me because I want everything. I know. I never lost. I never had one. I mean, but now, you know, I see this stuff that's coming out of Monte Grosso. I guess you've seen it. They found like 30 new species of tetras. Uh, but some of them have been around. Oh, I had some of them. But they're really some really neat stuff. I says, boy, what on, why, why didn't I have that when I was around? Because I would have a lot of them. I know a lot of them. Right? There was a lull on uh, new Tetras for a while that you just yeah. didn't get anything new. And now lately there's a lot of them coming out, but like you mentioned, 30, $40 a piece for some of them. I'm uh, ridiculous. I know. Randy, uh, this is Joe for Denzi. Yes. Uh, Joe. Yeah. I mean, all these very nice comments from your members. And I just want to remind them that, you know, these memories and these wonderful stories that Rosario has, there's more of them and many of them in his book. And I just, you know, it's it's available on Amazon, right? That's it. It's called An Aquarist Journey. And it's a terrific book. And I just want to remind everybody that you just go on Amazon and buy it and it's on its way. And then you'll have all these stories and more. Anytime you want to pick up the book and read it and, and look at the wonderful photographs that Rosario yeah. has in there. Um, I mean, it, it's an amazing book. 